Hello and a warm welcome to Personal Finance. I'm Kukule Tukele. Now today, joining us from our Cape Town studios is Corin Mullen, who's the Head of Growth Market Solutions at Samlan. Now this is to take us through a key theme that has definitely made headlines over recent weeks, given the uh, identification as well as the resurgence of various Ponzi or permit scheme looking like investment uh, options that are available out here in South Africa. Thank you so much for your time today, Corin. Uh, and you basically going to equip us with uh, the keys to identify a potential Ponzi scheme and more importantly how to respond to them but first things first what is the definition of a ponzi or pyramid scheme well a ponzi or pyramid scheme is basically a, a kind of a mechanism that asks you um, to invest money and the return that you are given in a ponzi or a pyramid scheme doesn't come from the underlying investments now for example, if you invest in a unit trust, then the unit trust company, the collective investment schemes company, take your money, invest that into the market, and the return that you are given comes from how well the companies do that they invest in. In a Ponzi or a pyramid scheme, there is nothing underneath it to actually generate that return. And you are in fact taking money from one investor to pay another investor. One of the big differences between a Ponzi and a pyramid scheme is that the pyramid scheme actually asks you to recruit other members and that's how um, it grows, whereas a Ponzi scheme just takes money from Peter to pay Paul. The Consumer Protection Act has actually helped us in this regard to, to start to formalize some of the definitions around it and they basically define it as something that gives a return of more than 20% above the repo rate. If we do get into that uh, particular figure, I take it the repo rate at the moment is around where? Is it 8.25%? Uh, 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 perhaps remind us there, Karen, and what the uh, uh, exorbitant interest rate would be um, on a potential Ponzi scheme in South Africa. Well, at the moment it's 7%. So anybody who pays at a rate greater than 27% than would um, basically be uh, then in contravention of the, the Consumer Protection Act. Mm. Um, uh, it is possible, obviously, that um, one can over time sometimes get higher returns than, than a repo rate, but a Ponzi scheme doesn't get assets to, to generate this, this greater return. Um, and I think the reason why the Consumer Protection Act started to put some numbers towards it is because we have been telling consumers over the last couple of years, if something looks too good to be true, it likely is, but obviously um, we need to kind of put that for consumers into context about what is too good to be true. Mm. On that particular point though, Karen, you do mention that a typical Ponzi or pyramid schemes are begging from Peter to pay Paul or the recruitment of individuals. Some might argue that they're close to what, 54 million people in South Africa. So uh, could the pie ever get too small for us to actually interchange money and hands between ourselves, uh, especially given the fact that some Ponzi schemes present themselves uh, to deliver the concept of a stock file? Well, um, if we think about uh, a stock file, how does a stock file work? A, a stock file regulates itself by the people in the stock file knowing each other. So it's, it's me and you and we are friends or we in the same community and I know, I know you, I know where you live, I, I can rely on you because um, there's, a, there's a community element in it and a familiarity element to it. Now if if these investment schemes uh, only um, facilitated lending and the return was the, the, the return on um, the, the, the loan, then it would also have been something, something different. However, you have to ask, where does the return come from? Mm -hmm. If I um, provide you with money and there is no obligation on you to repay at a specific rate, where does the return that I'm promised then come from? Um, and that's where you have to start to see the, but what is the asset underneath it that actually provides the value? Mm -hmm. So if we're in a stock file and all of us contribute money and at the end of the year we use it to, for, for something of our own good or we contribute all our money together and we each get a turn to get it. So you understand what's the amount of money available in the pot. 
even as a stock fell, if we take that money and we lend it out, then return that we, we as stock fell members get is basically the repayment of the loan and the additional interest somebody pays us on that loan. And we can regulate that because we can go and ask you for your money because we know where you live, we uh, know your mother, we know your family, and it's a, it's a close-knit community element. So I personally think that some of these schemes trying to present themselves as stock files are actually not doing stock files any favours. Mm. Karin, if we also take a look at some of the other red flags to look out for, I take it uh, organisations or investment schemes that don't have a registered office or a registered FSB number, should we see a lot of caution there and should that make us uh, be more, more aware when it comes to these investment options? Absolutely. Um, Regulation is there to protect you as the consumer, whether or not it's the Long Term Insurance Act or the Collective Investment Schemes Act or the Banking Act. Those regulations are in place to make sure that you as the consumer have got recourse, that the, the company who handles your money does so within certain rules. Um, and that uh, it is safeguarded and kept separate from the company's money, that there's appropriate mechanisms in terms of governance and auditing, etc., at the back of it. That's what those regulations does. So that's why it's important to, to check um, across the whole process. Firstly, check who is the firm that I'm doing business with. Um, is the firm registered? Is it a, is it a registered entity? Um, uh, how long have they been existent? What is their track record? Secondly, you need to check the, the advisor who's actually advising you on this investment, whether or not that person is registered as well. And um, uh, what's their track record and, and who are their other clients? Mm. The third thing that you need to check is the, the, the details of the investment itself. What are you buying? What are you investing in? And what is actually giving you the return and what sits underneath the investment that you're doing? And I think that the fourth thing that people often forget to do is, what's the obligation on me? What is required from me in, in this, this instance? And that is frequently where the red flag should be starting to, to wave or the alarm bell should start to go off. Exactly. Coming back to the individual for a moment, Karen, there might be those who might have invested in these products and Ponzi schemes and actually made a positive return and uh, uh, found favour with them. Do they have any legal recourse or are they liable to pay any particular taxes uh, uh, or any other associated costs with the gains that they've made, even though it does come from an illegal uh, uh, um, operation? Um, absolutely. In, in all contexts, how we deal with our money is um, within the, the, the tax net. So um, if I um, give money above certain thresholds um, to somebody as a donation of any way, shape and for, form, um, with only a couple of exceptions allowed, it's subject to donations tax. Um, my return on my investment, that is also subject to tax. And generally how that will be viewed is depending on what kind of investment I'm making. So if I'm investing my money within a normal policy, that will be taxed in accordance with how a policy gets managed and gets taxed with inside the policy. If however I invest in other types of vehicles, that gets taxed in my own hands as a, an investment. So um, it doesn't actually matter how you um, obtain a return, um, there is a tax implication. So the question is, what kind of investment vehicle is it? How will that then be handled from uh, a tax perspective? And only in the instances where there is specific tax treatment like a uh, retirement saving or um, a life policy or um, a tax-free savings account, those deal with tax on its own. Other than that, you will be taxed on it. Mm -hmm. And for those who maybe might invest in these uh, investment vehicles and then lose their money, do they have any re uh, legal recourse? Well, um, I think history has shown that, that it is quite difficult to, to, to get your money back. 
Uh, and this comes from not being invested in something that is within a, a legal framework that provides some protection for you. So getting your money out of uh, a fraudulent scheme is, is very, very hard. And actually, it requires you to, to try to obtain the money out of that scheme. And frequently, when things start to go south and start to go wrong, um, there, there isn't an awful lot of money left that um, the, the investors can um, try to get their hands on again. Mm. Well, we've certainly said quite a bit, Karen, but let's get a quick reminder now of some of the key takeaway points from tonight's discussion. Karen, we've clearly trying to uh, empower and uh, arm our viewers this evening with knowledge to be able to identify uh, Ponzi or pyramid schemes. But if you could give us key critical, key critical points rather to focus on, what would they be? I would say inform yourself as much as possible. Um, regulation and structures are there to protect you. So make sure before you do any investment, whether or not the company that you are entrusting your hard earned money to is registered by looking at the FSB website and looking for the licensed financial services provider uh, number. Make sure that the advisor who's advising you to invest in it is registered. Make sure that you understand how you are going to get a return by making sure that you, that you understand the actual investment. And lastly, be very careful if there is any obligation on you to attract additional investors. Perfect. Karen, thank you so much this evening for uh, enlightening us with some key knowledge to uh, be aware of when it comes to investment vehicles, which might be of a fraudulent nature. Well, that's where we leave it for personal finance tonight. A big thank you once more to Karen Muller, who's the head of Growth Market Solutions at Sunlam. Remember that you too can share your feedback with us, and I know there'll be a lot of comments on this particular episode, so go ahead, get tweeting. Uh, it's, the account name is at CNBC Africa using the hashtag finance410 or you can tweet myself at Kukumfupi. Until next time though, have a wonderful evening.